Hi Mitternand, I want to present you the civil protection in Switzerland, which is hardly mentioned because the Swiss military is most likely the topic, and none of the alternative ways to fulfill the obligation requested by the government. But first the basics. In Switzerland the military service is mandatory for all male Swiss citizens over 18 years and women can partake voluntarily. Every male Swiss citizen will receive an invitation to a mandatory orientation day to inform about the military service and the alternatives. Two to three years later you receive a letter stating the facility for the recruitment process. There are six available and you will stay for two days at the closest one. In my case the recruitment center is not on the map since it was replaced last year by the one in Aarau. There you will be evaluated physically, intellectually and psychologically with written exams or tests like eyesight and hearing examinations as well as by a physician and a psychologist. As a side note, in my school there was a rumor that the medical exam includes an examination of the testicles for cancer. Some were rather uneasy about the prospect of some unfamiliar physician examining their testicles. In the end, there wasn't anything of that sort, at least my assigned physician didn't. Back to the topic. At the end of the process, you will be assigned to one of three categories. Fit for military service, aka tauglich. Once unfit, referred as einmal ute, the proper term is fit for civil protection. And the last category is twice unfit, aka zweimal ute, or unfit for service. The second and third category has to pay a fee called Wehrpflichtersatzabgob, which is reduced by a percentage for each day servicing in the civil protection, so the fee is lower for the second category. For the first category there are two options, the military service and the civilian service. The second has just the civil protection. A very quick rundown of the Swiss military. The Swiss army is a militia army, but of course some parts are run by people working there and the upper echelons are fully paid posts as well. The minimum training period spans over 245 days, which are split into 3 days recruitment, 121 military training school, 6 refresher courses with 19 days each and 4 additional days. Your employer is obliged to give you a leave for every refresher course. There is the possibility to fulfill the entire duty without intermission, but this is within 300 days, so 10 months. The training is on weekdays, with weekends at home, except if you have guard duty over the weekend. That's the reason why many are familiar with the military. You see them across Switzerland on Mondays, going to the barracks with their basic gear including their weapon, or back home on Fridays. With see them I mean the huge part of recruits who travel with public transport, which is encouraged by the military and due to the free travel while in military uniform many take this option. I saw them frequently starting from 10th grade while traveling with regional rail. Later on I often used the intercity rail and sometimes half of the wagon were recruits only. So yeah, quite visible. The variation of options is huge, from logistician over tank driver or medic to grenadier. Everything an army needs is trained, there is only a lag in cyber defense. It's a work in progress, but a rather slow process, which doesn't surprise me. Now to the civilian service. If you have moral conflicts which you are able to state convincingly, you can change to the civilian service. You will have to serve 1.5 times the duration of the military duty. So 368 days with one continuous service of 180 days. If you change from military service after boot camp you don't have to do the 180 days. The remaining time will still be multiplied by 1.5. The minimum per year is 26 days and everyone takes care of the service themselves by directly inquiring or via an internet platform run by the federal office. The service can for example be in a nursing home, restoring old hiking trails or helping farmers. There is a wide variety of jobs. A problem though is the exploitation of civilian service providers because they are cheap labor. They are paid by the government and the employer is only responsible for board and lodging as well as pocket money. 
On the flip side, there are farmers on higher altitudes which depend on this, so it isn't negative per se. Especially because there are even organizations like the Caritas which help mountain farmers by providing temporary workers via their program Bergeinsatz. Now to the civil protection. The civil protection organization, to shorten it civil protection, is part of the civil protection system. This system is for the safety of the population in case of emergencies or catastrophes as well as armed conflict. It provides guidance, help, protection and rescue to overcome these events. This system consists of the healthcare services, police, fire service, technical services and the civil protection. The first three are self-explanatory, so I skip to the technical services. These include critical services, like waterworks and electricity plants, as well as communication services and waste disposal, which all work with the other organizations to resolve the situation quickly. In short, the civil protection is to support these partner organizations with manpower if they cannot handle the situation themselves, which especially gets a problem over a longer period of time. Additionally, they provide shelter for people who lost their homes, provide information, care for the affected persons and protect cultural assets. So a rather broad scope of duties. The military is called if even the civil protection has not enough personnel or appropriate means, for example helicopters. The organizational structure is like this. Management support is mainly gathering information and distributing it. Furthermore, they are responsible for coordination of NBC measures and logistics. They are known as Stabsassistent. Assistance and protection, most of the times just called Betreuer, has the duty to assist people seeking protection and support the emergency personnel. Cultural property protection is the branch which plans the rescue of cultural assets and is assigned with the transport and storage in an emergency. Support stands for the persons with tools to support the emergency personnel out in the field, especially for rescue and erecting temporary structures. The colloquial term is pioneer. Last but not least, the logistics branch, which is responsible for the maintenance and provision of the equipment and tools and the maintenance of facilities, as well as transportation of personnel and goods. Furthermore, they provide the meals. At the end of the recruitment, you get the verdict of tauglich, einmal ute or zweimal ute. I got einmal ute due to a knee injury which prevents me of partaking in long marches with heavy gear. And to be honest, I wasn't very keen on military service, so I didn't fight to get in. I heard various stories before the recruitment and later from peers and friends who trained in the military. Many very funny for the involved people, but not in line how the army presents itself. That wasn't very enticing for me. The basic choice for the civil protection is staff assistant, carer and pioneer. Very few vacancies are open for the cultural property protection, and some with knowledge and interest in natural sciences are asked if they are willing to join the MBC unit. I was asked as well because of my focus in biology and chemistry in high school, but I declined. I wasn't very comfortable with the idea of being a first responder if the nearby atomic power plant had a malfunction. Not that it would matter after a critical incident. I chose Caro in the end because Pioneer isn't my cup of tea, staff assistant sounded very boring and contact with people seemed to be the most interesting. After the assignment I had two courses over the span of two years, the AGA, the general training, which is the same for everyone, and then the FGR, the training concerning the basic functions, so splitting into carer, pioneer and staff assistant. The duration for both together is between 10 to 19 days, depending on the canton. I had 15 days. In my case as a carer for example there were lessons about religions, disabilities, elder people etc. to get a wide overview of people I should be able to provide assistance. In many cases it boils down to respect but in some cases it is about communication, for example with deaf people. I have no clue about the sign language anymore but we were introduced to it. 
There is not enough time to have an in-depth view into a topic, but the exposure counts for something, in my opinion. For the practical side we simulated the care of people with erecting a collecting point, running a care shelter to inform and have a rest place for a couple of hours and preparing a civil bunker to accommodate people with no other options. At the collection point we gathered data like name, accommodation option and if family members were missing. The ones who wanted to rest first and the ones without an accommodation were transported to the civil bunker. We prepared a separate room to rest and wait for further information. The collection point was a huge tent by the way, which can be erected pretty much everywhere, but seems pointless in most cases if you just could use town halls, sport halls, etc. I guess I have the skill now. Additionally, there was an internship in a nursing home for three days. I found this experience profound, because there weren't just elderly people, but people with dementia. Three days alone is quite something if they are not able to remember you or sometimes tell the same story. What really was gut-wrenching was the sudden realization of a gentleman that he has some problem, but he doesn't know which. To then reassure nothing was wrong was unsettling, to say the least. What I also noticed was the joy some had while talking with me because there were many times the staff could only tend to their basic needs and more was just not feasible. And interesting stories were one nice part of the internship. For example about a cycling enthusiast or a lady's father who played stoically the piano in a Polish town during World War II to not let the world turn completely bleak. Quite poetic in my mind's eyes. Overall, the training was useful preparation for my function, as it should be. Afterwards, everyone is assigned a CPO close to their residency to have the shortest distance in case of emergency. As an example, the most populated canton Zuri, with the municipalities joining to form the CPOs. The city has of course its own CPO, and just the small municipalities join forces. From then on, there are refresher courses every year and depending on the canton, they last 2 to 5 days. Of course, mine are 5 days. Emergency calls are by mail and SMS, and for higher ups via pager. If you are not in the country, you can decline. If you are not close by, you can state when you are able to reach the meeting point or commando post. But there are no sanctions, yet, if you decline, although you are able to come, which actually poses a huge problem. My company is quite small and therefore doesn't have big funding and hence the civil bunkers are not modernized for the needs today and some of the tools are a bit old. New mortars are more important than the equipment of the civil protection, I guess. I could end with this, since I presented the Swiss system on a basic level, but I wanted to add some of my experiences. On the third day of my first refresher course something happened which every person with several years in this company said would not happen. An emergency call by the fire service. They needed a civil protection due to floods in several municipalities and for a small CPO like ours that means everyone, so staff assistant and carers as well, are helping with pumping water out of cellars and removing debris. Within three days, from allegedly nothing happens ever, it's really just relaxing, to eight hours of labor. Mm-hmm, sure. I'm not really complaining though because we definitely prove that we aren't just a burden for the taxpayers, but actually a help. Funnily enough, two weeks later there was another call, again because of floods, and this time the group I was part of was supporting for 11 hours. But to put the focus onto the people who are the heroes in all these incidences. The fire service were first responders and were incredibly well organized and prepared to deal with the situation. They had to call for backup because they have finite amount of people and resources and needed persons for the cleanup. Also, they just need to rest. Our lack of organization was visible when one sees three persons standing around a mobile generator because they only see two of the three switches necessary to start it and don't know the order of actuation. All three were carers, so there was no instruction beforehand. I was definitely not a part of that. 
Fortunately enough, one of the higher ups cared about our experiences, so I described him some issues. Lo and behold, handling of pumps as well as generators were a block in the next refresher course. I have spoken long enough about the civil protection, and before this overview gets completely overblown, I stop with this. All the sources are in the description, but unfortunately many pages aren't translated into English, so you have to trust me, or use a translator. I appreciate comments, but please behave respectfully. Thanks for your attention, and have a magnificent day.